Hey everybody, my name is Matt, and I have the privilege of serving here as the lead pastor at Hamilton Hills Church. We just wanna say thank you for watching online, and while you're enjoying this experience, would you please consider sharing it, and then also prayerfully supporting Hamilton Hills Church financially. My name's Denise, and I also get the privilege of serving here on staff. And we hope that you find encouragement and a way to better yourself from what you're about to experience. If we were gonna tell you one thing about our church, this is what we would want you to know, that we are one big family, a family that's doing our best together to learn what it looks like to follow Jesus and tell others in the front row of our life, which we call here our oikos, about the good news that Jesus really does make our lives better. We have a saying here, life is messy, everyone is welcome, and anything is possible. The reason we say life is messy is because we all are broken people. And we say everyone is welcome because no matter your mess, Jesus loves you, and we do as well. And lastly, we say anything is possible. And we say that because no matter our mess, Jesus is the only one that can take what's broken and truly make it beautiful. Well, we're thankful that we get to provide this online experience but we also want to invite you to join us here in person. Now we understand that there's always um, someone that can't attend, which is why we feel the importance of making this experience available online. But we also know that there is no replacement for gathering together and finding strength in community. So if you're able to come to one of our in-person gatherings, please come. We'd love to find you. Come find us, we'll say hi, we'd love to meet you. So we hope this message encourages your heart as you watch today, enjoy. Where the 
should be a casket. The children are singing, singing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers. Rivers of tears flow from good times when Families are singing and dancing. The Father is welcome. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound. In the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. because it matters to God. So, if family matters, how do we communicate as a family? How do we live boldly as a family? And how do we forgive as a family? Or you might be asking, is my family beyond hope? Here's the thing, families are messy because life is messy. Family is sometimes the easiest to count on and also sometimes the hardest to love. But God sees dignity even in our family's dysfunction. So don't give up hope. There can be beauty in the chaos. All right, brand new series, Family Matters. So here we go. I've, I haven't spoke in about four weeks, so I'm like fired up. I got some caffeine in me and I am ready to rumble. So it'll be two hours from now, we'll have the invitation. It'd be great, I'm just kidding. Look at your neighbor and say, family matters. Go ahead, nice and loud. Go ahead. <laughs> family matters. Now look at someone you like and say, family matters. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, many of you, you just turned the other side to uh, uh, someone that wasn't in your family anyway and said, family matters. You mean, your family matters. Uh, mine will hopefully one day. Hey, life is messy, and so family is messy. Anybody have family? Anyone in your family? You don't have to point. You'd say, sometimes my family's a little messy. Anybody in here? Okay, hands raised. Okay, I see those hands. All right. We're going to talk about family and family dynamics, and, and, and I am uh, in awareness that as we talk to a crowd this big, uh, uh, that Family can be messy and everyone's family dynamics may look a little different. Uh, some of us could be estranged from part of our family. There's divorce, there is uh, uh, separation, there's all kinds of things that we can go through. Uh, there can be some of you in here that are single. You go, I don't have a family, but we all come from a family. And for some of us, our family may not be so much our biological family as they are someone that is our chosen family. And I can honestly say in all authenticity here this morning that no matter what your family dynamic is, God has redeemed our family by making us a part of his family or giving us the invitation to be a part of his family. So if you're a part of the family of God, Thank you for being here. If you aren't a part of the family of God, the door is wide open and the invitation is for you to be a part of the family of God. For the next four weeks, we are going to talk about some family dynamics, some reasons why family matters. I thought about getting my Steve Urkel uh, costume out and putting some suspenders on and just coming out and no, okay. Uh, so some of you just, you know, you're like, no, no, do it, do it. We'll get our phones out and it'll make the gram. Yeah, I know, huh? you, be, you cruel, you guys are cruel. The enemy has attacked, Satan has attacked the family for years, thousands of years. In fact, we're gonna look at a story from 
the book of Genesis in chapters 1, 2, and 3, how the very first family that was ever created was attacked by the enemy because he knew that the family matters because it matters to God. And can I tell you this morning that no matter what your family looks like or the mess your family has created, or maybe the mess you've created for your family, can I tell you this, that you matter to God and your family matters to God. In a big, big way, I hope to open your heart, not just your mind, but open your heart to the fact that there is a great purpose on your family. You ever had an uncomfortable family conversation? (laughs) I don't have to have you raise your hands because if you have family, you've had an uncomfortable family conversation. In fact, maybe for some of you or all of you in here this morning, you had an uncomfortable conversation with your family today, right? On the way to church, it was uncomfortable. Uh, You ever had the ride to church be uncomfortable because of the conversation you had with your family right before you all got in the vehicle on your way to church where you were shoving Cheerios down the kids' throats? Right? And then this person was saying this and this kid was saying this to that. And you were like, shut up in the name of Jesus. Be quiet. We're going to church. And then as you pulled in, hey, how's it going? (laughs) You're laughing because it happened today. Family, someone said, yep. Online, you're probably having an argument right now with your family. Here's the thing about uh, uncomfortable conversations. And we did this in our elephant series, we can be comfortable, which many of us strive to be, right? It's the American dream. How can we live the most comfortably? But the truth is we can be comfortable or we can be honest. Very rarely are honest conversations comfortable conversations. But here's what's so awesome about God and his word is God gives us the ability to have uncomfortable conversations with confidence and with boldness and with peace and with the ability to have love. If we believe that the family matters, then we must ask ourselves hard questions. And so I want to start off the series with this question, and we'll come to this question throughout the series. And here it is. What do I want from my family Versus this question that I hope we'll all be asking ourselves at the end of the series. What does God want for my family? If I were to give a quiz or maybe take hands that were raised and say, why does family matter to you? Most of us, including myself, would be quick to answer about all the things that family provides for us. Family matters because of the provision, because of the protection maybe. Uh, It could matter to us because of the safety that happens within the family unit or understanding or if you're a student in here, family matters to you because Christmas is coming in several months and you are going to get that thing that you dreamed you could get. Most of us look at family from a selfish perspective of how family provides for us, our spouses, we look at our husband or our wife, at what they can provide for us as opposed to looking at family from an eternal perspective that God has something much greater for your family and it's called purpose. You see, from the very beginning of time, the family was created. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. And as the family was created, it was created before there was sin in the world. And the purpose for that family being created was because God had spent five days creating this beautiful creation. And then he said, I am going to create someone in my own image to care for the world and multiply in it to build essentially his kingdom. And the family even today is to build the kingdom of God and it's redeemed through the family of God. But God has a role for every person in your family that's much greater than just survival. Does anybody in here, can I get an amen where you feel like when you're part of a family, it's just survival, right? You're already thinking about Thanksgiving, 
Oh boy. And the relative that doesn't agree with you politically or on religion or on really anything. And you wonder how biologically you can be so related, but be so unrelatable. We spend our time as a family just trying to survive as opposed to thriving because of the purpose that God has given each and every one of us. And I tell you right now, the enemy may be speaking into your, into your ear, into your mind, into your brain saying, but your fam- my family's really messed up. I know Pastor Matt is saying like families can be messy, but mine really is messy. Even in the dysfunction, God has a purpose for you and for your family. And you say, well, but you still don't understand my family. Let me introduce you today. The very first family, Adam and Eve, the ones that brought sin into the world. You say, yeah, but well, well, let me also introduce their first baby bouncing boy, Cain, who became the murderer of his younger brother. Family has been messy from the very, very first one. And we're going to look and find some principles found in the very first family dysfunction. I kind of picture all of this happening around a Thanksgiving table. We look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 27, and we see the family formed first. Uh, God says he created human beings, loved Jason's message last week, not human doings, human beings in what? His own image. So from the very beginning, before there is sin, we see original intent of how God created the family. So don't let this get us off track where we go, oh my gosh, that was the original intent. Well, I'm failing that. Well, so have we all. But he created us in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. If you might have a translation that says, uh, fill the earth and rule it. Important about that word rule is that it means to care and to serve. We oftentimes think of ruling as coming in with a domineering fist, right? Or you have to do what I say. But ruling was given to human beings, to male and female, to come together, be a part and make whole in community with God, a purpose for ruling and governing all of this creation, this beautiful garden, this beautiful world that God had created. And our job was to serve it and to care for it and to multiply in this world, to build this kingdom of God. This is before sin. Then Genesis chapter two and verse 21 and 24, the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and watch football on the couch on Sunday afternoon. I just added that first part. That's actually in 1 Thessalonians. (laughs) While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs. And uh, another little side note on that word rib. That's the only time that word in Hebrew is translated rib. All the other times it's translated side or pillar. A architectural structure of the man was taken out. So he was divided in half and God created woman. And closed up the opening. Then The Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to man. And the man exclaimed, at last. So that's how when I saw Denise, the first time we ever met, I looked at her and I said, at last, Denise. This one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united in one. This is important, especially In the society we live in, the reason why marriage and man and woman were created to be apart or or to come together are because God decided that this half and this half are important to each other to glorify God in community with God. Then we don't take very long to get to chapter number three. God creates husband and wife. He sets them in motion with purpose of building the kingdom of God, and then the fall of man happens. You guys ready to talk about 
family is messy. Here we go. It doesn't take very many chapters. Beautiful creation. God, Taylor makes this man. Taylor makes this woman. Gives them an incredible purpose. And then chapter three. In fact, as I start chapter three, you've heard of Adam and Eve and the serpent, right? Can you go ahead and throw up the picture? Did this, did this come to your mind? Maybe it was a children's book that you saw. Yeah. There it is. I love the fact that it's a, I think that's an apple. Is that an apple? Yeah. I believe that the fruit was a banana because bananas are terrible, terrible fruit. There's got to be evil in them somewhere. Uh, The consistency, smell, taste, all of it, just absolutely disgusting. But the Bible says actually the fruit was good to look upon, so it probably wasn't banana. You can take that down because everyone will be staring at that. The serpent... In verse number one, was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. And one day he asked the woman, I love the way the enemy works. He doesn't say anything that's not necessarily not true, but causes Eve to start doubting what God said. He says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say that? The woman replies, she says, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you should surely die. So Eve is saying back to the serpent, like, there's a reason why God said not to touch that. Because if we touch that, we'll die. The serpent says, you won't die. He replies to the woman, verse number five, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. God doesn't really care about you. He wants to keep you on this level and not on his level because he's afraid about what you'll find out with what you will know. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. And she saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious. So it must not have been a banana. And then she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. We see from the very first family debacle, the issue becomes a communication issue. You ever had a communication issue with someone in your family? You ever communicated wrong? Have you ever said something, and then your spouse gone, what did you say? What did you just say to me? Uh, 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 Right? Communication is so important. Have you ever had the silent treatment before? Ooh, that's worse than bad communication, right? Yeah? Some of you spouses just looked at each other. You went, "Mm hmm, we did that this morning. (laughs) Communication matters. In fact, there is many books on communication. If you were to type in your Amazon search bar, family communication, you'd come up with hundreds and hundreds of books that have been written on how to communicate with your family. I love one of them. It's called The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. It's a great book on communication and how to communicate with other people, but also especially with your spouse. There's uh, five love languages for teenagers and how to talk to your kids. Great books, many of them written by followers of Jesus, some not written by followers of Jesus. Because communication matters. How you communicate matters. Today, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I want to set the tone and the foundation for the rest of the series on what I believe is ultimately important when it comes to communication breakdown. All healthy communication comes from God. And all healthy communication principles come from God. And we're going to look at that this morning off of point number one. You can take a picture of this or write it down. If you don't write down any other point, write down this point right here. What God says matters. If you're looking for a series that starts off with, here's how you communicate with your wife, or here's how you communicate with your husband, or here's how you communicate with your kids. All of those things are important. Those principles are important. But here is where we oftentimes leave out the very first most important communication of all when it comes to our family. And that is this. We forget to communicate with God. Or he's communicating and we're not 
listening. Because God speaks with a still small voice. He doesn't shout it from the rooftops and make you listen. He speaks with a still small voice. I remember especially when my daughter was a lot younger. Sunday afternoon would hit. TV goes on. Especially guys, right? NFL season. And my daughter would be saying something. She'd be asking some question. And I'd be watching the television and I'd be doing this. "Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And then I have no idea what I've agreed to. She learned very quickly that while my attention was on something else, I would agree to just about anything. Right? So if you don't get the answers you want from mom, just go to dad while he's watching SportsCenter. Sometimes we're not listening to what God has to say. Let's look again at verse number one in chapter three. The serpent, shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? Can I share with you something that's important for all of us, once again, in our families, but no matter where you are as a follower of Jesus or not a follower, Faith has always been a part of our communication with God. I grew up thinking that faith was part of sin coming into the world because sin came into the world. We need faith to trust God that if we trust him, he will start a relationship with us. We'll start a relationship with him and we can live with him for eternity. And that's all because of the fall. But the truth of the matter is, is that faith has always been a part of being in relationship with God, even previous to sin. What does the serpent say to Eve? Did God really say? And so Eve starts questioning the very words of her creator, the very words of the the one who had spent time with her walking through the garden and time with Adam walking through the garden. And all the serpent has to do is put a little bit of doubt in Eve's mind and in Eve's ear. And all of a sudden, she starts questioning the very words of God. God has always asked us to trust our, his word and what he says. And many of us look at that as kind of like, oh, that's part of the fall. That's part of sin. That's part of the curse. It's actually not a curse. It's actually a gift to be able to trust by faith. Even before sin came into the world, God told human beings, trust me at my word. Follow me. You will not understand everything. In fact, he said it as an example in the middle of the garden, the knowledge of good and evil. He said, trust me. You don't need to know that. What you need to know is that I love you and what you need to do is follow my word and trust my word. And what did we do as human beings from the very beginning of time? We went, eh, no better. I don't know if I can trust him at his word. And the serpent finds Eve in isolation, plants the lie. Eve uses her own human reasoning to go, well, looks pretty good to eat. Well, I really want to know those things. And so she eats. And then point number two, family communication matters because after Eve eats it, what does Adam do? Well, I really like making out with Eve. She's offering me that fruit. If I say no, maybe she'll stop kissing me. Okay, I'll take it. He didn't think twice about it. He went, okay, I'll eat it. And he just eats it. There's no communication first with God. And then there is no communication among their family. The breakdown happens first because of communication. Can I tell you this morning that God has something greater for your family than the arguments of human reasoning among yourselves. We oftentimes look at family communication as who is going to assert dominance in the relationship. Or we look at family communication as who is going to win the political battle. Who is going to be right? You ever been in a fight with someone in your family and then you honestly forget 
why you're fighting. You just want to be right. I'm the only one. You guys did a really good job of just blankly staring back at me and going, no, Pastor Matt, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. What ends up happening is the war, the right to claim dominance of the smarter person in the family becomes much more important than what actually is truth. And so our conversations that end up happening between our children, between our spouses, between our extended family, between our moms and between our dad becomes about human reasoning as opposed to what did God say? Truth has to come from somewhere and it comes from the word of God and through his spirit. And if we're not first talking to God, how can we Get to even point two of communicating with our family the right way because what we start doing is communicating all of our truth. And then what happens? Oh, I love this passage. This is one of my favorite. In point number two, Genesis chapter three, verse eight through 13, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man, this is after they had eaten not the banana, the apple. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. So his eyes are open to the knowledge of good and evil and all these things. And now he has found himself embarrassed. He's found himself ashamed. And so he's hiding And I love what God says. He goes, who told you you were naked? (laughs) Who told you that? Because you're not supposed to know. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And then if I could go back in time, stand next to Adam, I'd say, don't say what is about to come out of your mouth. You're still married to Eve. God said, be fruitful and multiply. You ain't going to do any multiplying if you say this. The man replied, it was the woman you gave me. And I ate it. It's not my fault. Think of how dumb that logic is. I didn't know what to do. I don't make any decision for myself. You gave me this woman and then she was like, here, take it. What was I supposed to do? So then... And God looks at the woman and says, what have you done? She goes, well, did the serpent deceive me? That's why I ate it. Here's what happens when family communication breaks down and we don't bring people to the table. We don't involve God in our communication. And he is not the one giving us our truth. We start playing the blame game. And nothing is ever our fault. Here's a good litmus test to see if you're listening to God and you're letting God talk to you. Is anything ever your fault? If you're in an argument with your spouse or your children and you have at the end of it nothing to apologize for, there's a problem. And the problem is usually this. We didn't communicate properly. We are not letting the Holy Spirit speak to us Because I can tell you when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and convicting me and I am in the word of God, when I get done with an argument with my wife, I have a lot to apologize for. Which is why I never apologize. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Serpent deceived me. It's the woman that you gave me. All of this communication matters. I know this is going back to point one, but if you'll throw up this slide, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. You ever said something and you were like, where did that come from? Your heart. That cruel, hurtful thing that you said to your wife or to your husband and you're like, where did that come from? Your heart. That thing that you said to your mom or your dad that you wish you could take back, student, 
Or, older person, where did that come from? It comes from our heart. What we say comes from our heart. So our communication is a product of what's in our heart. And our heart is a product of to whom you listen. Can I ask you this morning, who are you or what are you listening to? What you read, what you watch, this is going old school, right? This is going old school. This is from when I was a kid sitting under my dad's preaching and he would talk about the music and the television and all those things were evil. Can I just go a little old school for a second and say what you put in your heart will come out. So be careful what you put in your heart. Be careful. That show that you watch that you don't think affects you, you know the one that the Holy Spirit's bringing up to you right now if you're a follower of Jesus? With all that sexuality, it doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. It does. We're not the exception to the rule. I'm not the exception to the rule. There are times when I wonder, why is this coming out of my mouth? Why am I acting this way? Why am I speaking this way? And it's usually because what I'm putting into my heart. And we've all been guilty. I have. What goes in your heart is a product of, to what we watch, to what we listen And it affects our family communication and how we communicate one to another. And then lastly, number three, how you communicate matters. (laughs) I could look at you this morning and say this. I'll look you all in the eye. You ready? You ready for like soul to soul? I absolutely love you. Each and every one of you in here, I love you. I could also say... I love you. (laughs) And those mean two absolutely different things said with the exact same words. What you say matters, but also how you say it matters. And the Bible has a lot to say this. And I don't have time to uh, make the parallel here, but in Ephesians chapter four, we're going to read a couple of verses. Paul is talking to the church family, which is the redeeming uh, tool for the biological family of how we can now build the kingdom of God. So these directly parallel into how we can operate as a church family, but also how we can operate as a family, no matter what your dynamic is in here this morning. Ephesians 4, verse 14 through 15 says this, Then we'll be no longer immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced... Does this sound familiar? When people try to trick us with lies so clever, they sound like the truth. Lies that sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. The truth is the uncomfortable conversation. The love is finding a way to do it even though it's uncomfortable, but with the right spirit and with the right heart. Growing in every way more and more like Christ. Can I also put a sidebar in here and say, when we don't speak the truth in love, we're not speaking truth. A silence on something without speaking truth is just as damaging oftentimes as speaking a lie. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. So Ephesians 4.2, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Think about in your family and in your dynamic with your children, with your spouse, with your extended family, with your mom, with your dad, with that Thanksgiving table. Always be humble, be gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. We love asking people to make allowance for our own faults, but we oftentimes have a really hard time making allowance for the faults of our family because the faults of our family, I'm speaking right now of the biological family, but also of the family of God, hurt oftentimes the most. Right? And we find it easier to 
let someone else's faults go. Maybe they're a neighbor or maybe they're an acquaintance. But when it comes to our family, oftentimes we hold on to those faults because if we let them go, we feel like we're not going to be able to have dominance or be right within the family. Paul says, let them go. Make an allowance for others' faults because of your love. That doesn't excuse abuse. That doesn't excuse any type of behavior that would cause irreparable damage. And that's another sermon. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander as well of all types of evil behavior. You know what will make mom and dad, you lose your equity with your children the quickest? Anger and rage. And oftentimes that anger and rage comes out of because we've been holding truth. We've been not wanting to have the uncomfortable conversation. And so we hold it in and we hold it in and we hold it in hold it in until it gets so much that we just have to let it go. And what we've done is we've avoided the uncomfortable conversation in the beginning and we've lost equity with our children and we've lost equity with our family because we've made an outburst of anger. How you communicate matters and slander as well as all types of, what does Paul say? Evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. My mind goes back to Peter when he denied Jesus three times. And when Jesus saw him, he didn't lash out at him. He didn't hit him with anger. He didn't say, you idiot, I told you you were going to deny him. You still did it, you moron. He loved him. He was tenderhearted. He invited him in. He ate with him. Ephesians 4.29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. Can I first lay an outline here to say, if there's someone in here that hit that perfectly, then we need to bring you up and give you a round of applause and say, wow, you're the only one Congratulations, we've all done the opposite of that before. Thank God for his forgiveness and for his grace and for forgiving each other. And next week, we're going to talk about why forgiveness matters. I want you to invite someone in your front row, someone in your oikos, because it's going to be a powerful message, not because I'm bringing it, but because the word of God speaks very specifically to forgiveness and how it literally paves the road for being a Jesus follower, because we are to forgive as Christ forgave us. We are all in need of forgiveness. And so forgiveness is ours to give. And we're gonna look at what that means. If you look at the seat back in front of you, there should be a Family Matters card. Some of you already pulled it out, didn't you? You're like, oh, what's this? This is different. I've uh, received coaching before and I've given coaching. And one of the important things that they'll tell you in coaching, especially if you're coaching someone, is you don't let them off the hook. So if you're coaching someone in something, you say, okay, what's the issue? What do you want to work on? They give you the issue. And usually if, if you let someone off the hook, you just go, okay, are you going to fix that? And they go, uh-huh. And then what ends up happening? They don't fix it. Why? Because they may have specifically named something, but not said when they're going to do it. Some of us in here this morning need to have an uncomfortable conversation with someone in our family. Can I encourage you? Can I encourage you this morning? God has given you the ability through his spirit, if you're a follower of Christ, to have the boldness, confidence, peace, love, and joy to have that conversation. Some of you 
as I read through those verses, you may be feeling shame going, oh man, I've lost my testimony with my children. I have lost equity with my dad or I've lost equity with my mom or I've lost equity with that one family member, my brother or sister that's now estranged and I don't know how to have the conversation. Can I first say, don't do what Eve did and isolate yourself and say, I'm ashamed. I'm going to hide myself. Adam said, I'm going to hide myself. I'm not gonna talk to anybody about it. Instead, live into what God said. God said, you can have the conversation. And first and foremost, it starts with talking to him. Can I ask us all a sobering question? When's the last time that you let him speak to you? I didn't say pray to him. I didn't say as the person cut you off saying, Lord, vengeance, please. Or, oh God, help me in my day to do all the things that I want to do or that I feel called to do. I'm talking about when is the last time that you sat down and you said, God, speak to me. What do I need to hear from your voice? What do you want for my family? He wants your family to serve a greater purpose other than just surviving. He wants your family to thrive. I'm not talking about financially. Maybe it is financially. I'm not talking about health-wise. I'm talking about he wants you to thrive so that when you go home and when you operate as a family, you are serving a purpose that serves eternal value. Eternal value. That means God's given your family the ability to change your neighbor's life. It means your family has been designated, whether you feel this way or not, to reach someone in your front row that doesn't have hope and doesn't have Jesus, but can. And what Satan does is he distracts us with all these things that don't mean anything in the grand scheme. His purpose for you. So there should be a pen. You ready? Grab the pen. You grab the card, now grab the pen. Okay, and it says what and when. What do you need to say? We almost put like who, but then we didn't want you to be embarrassed if it's the person you're sitting next to. Okay, so you just think of the who, who you need to talk to. What do you need to say? You don't have to be super specific on this card. This is just an exercise to go, <laughs> I'm not gonna get away with just going, man, great message, Pastor Matt, or mediocre message, Pastor Matt. That was great. I really like the part with the banana. That was funny, right? And then we just all walk out and we don't leave changed. Or we don't leave with a next step. Here's the next step. The next step is what do you need to say to someone in your family? And it could be, I need to tell my daughter who's eight years old, I love you. I've been kind of like not communicating well. And I've been, every time I come home, I flip on the TV and I kind of zone out and I need to, maybe it's, you need to pay more attention during that time. You need to be present during that time. It could be any number of things from that small to, I need to call my parents and say, I forgive you. Or would you forgive me? What is it? And then I want you to write down when you're going to do it. And here's what we're gonna do. I'm not gonna be able to see the time on there, but I'm gonna pray. And we're gonna pray as a church right now that during that time, God would give you the boldness and the confidence to have the uncomfortable conversation and that you would walk away from that conversation going, God did something great. I didn't see how it was gonna happen, but he did something incredible through this conversation. Can I tell you, that that's how God operates. He says, trust me, trust me at my word. Would you stand with me? As we close, Father, as we hold these cards, I know the conversation I need to have. And Father, I'm not looking forward to it and I have a hundred reasons why it shouldn't happen. But God, I believe your spirit is true and your word is true. 
and that it isn't up to me. Father, if you're calling me to a conversation, that you'll give me the strength and the power to have that conversation. I may not feel the power, I may not feel the strength until after the conversation is over, but God, I believe by faith in what you've called all of us in here this morning to do. So in everything that has either been written on the card or maybe not written on the card yet, God, would you take those thoughts, those conversations, because you don't live in space and time, go forward in space and time and bless those conversations, be in control of those conversations. We believe that family matters because it matters to you. So God, as we leave here, would we love our families accordingly and would we communicate with our families appropriately and in love? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matt. All right, can we give God a hand today? We heard some awesome truth from his word and then that worship the Lord met with us today. It was so sweet and powerful all at the same time. Um, As we take these cards home, if you're someone that's, I know we prayed as a church together, uh, but if, if you're needing someone to talk to or prayer, please reach out to one of the pastors or come to our next steps table. We want to pray with you or for you. And if you did not get one of these, there will be some on the way out that you can pick up. Uh, There's going to be a powerful testimony that will be included in next week's um, service. So please invite a friend and you don't want to miss. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day.